the old days, I always have preferred to view the good old days as, as being in the future. Uh, and the trick is to get there. So um, I want to talk about what I'm working on now uh, as a tool uh, with intended consequences. Um, the fundamental question, I mean, when you get to be of a sufficiently mature age, as I am, uh, you start to wonder, oh, oh, who's behind me? And do they know what I learned? Now, generally, the human condition is that no, they don't know what you've learned. Uh, and you just have to live with that. But you have to try to make, improve the situation. So the question, as for the question of where are the hackers of the future coming from, and what can I slash we do to try to improve their quality? Um, I'm involved in a group called Hack the Future, which sets up one, events every couple of months, which we bring in a room full of 100 kids or so, and uh, from 10 to 18. And it's a kind of a hackathon for them, and we provide mentors and uh, help them out. Now, I'm using this opportunity to debug and continue development of a device that I have thought about for easily 15 years, but never really done anything about. And this is a, a kind of a, a learning building block, uh, which if it were available, would make possible extremely good quality hackers, in my humble opinion. Um, so the, the uh, it stems from, in large part, the observation that you can get a computer science degree and not know what a bit is. <laughs> Never having encountered a bit in your education. I find this to be shocking and, and uh, distressing. And uh, if, if somebody turns up who's only worked in high level languages, I have nothing to say to them, basically. Uh, they have everything to learn, but how they do it, I have no idea. So, uh, I learned my first uh, C syntax, my first high-level syntax, from the, the uh, couple uh, PLD programming language. They use the C syntax there. Uh, I can still, I can read C, but I can't write it, because I never bothered to learn all of the uh, uh, incantations and... Uh, all that's necessary to assemble all the pieces so the program will compile. Uh, but I, I did learn to handle the logic. And I'd like to be able to uh, pass that possibility along because it was, I, I learned that from, as I say, PLD programming. And PLDs, programmable logic devices, were originally called PALs, P-A-Ls, programmable array logic. But since that was a trademark term, everybody else didn't want to use it, so they used PLDs. But Mo Monolithic Memories in 1978 put out the line of PALs, and they explained what this was. I mean, it's a real problem. If you build something new, you have to explain it so people can use it if you want to sell it. Um, and they published several uh, manual-sized books with projects and gizmos you can build using this device. Now, what it is is an 8-bit state machine. I mean, the 16R, R for registered, 8s, well, there were 16R4s and 20R, etc. There are variations on the theme, but the, the, the basic one, fundamental one, had 8 registers in it. And then it had a structure like this. So here's one bit of the register. DCQ and I'll say QR. And the, the clock just came in from outside, was common to all of them. I see this is not going to give me a lot of ink. The D was fed from an OR of, in this case, up to eight lines of a matrix. And the, sig the, th the signals on the matrix were the inputs and their inverses. 
plus the outputs and their inverses all the way down the list of eight registers. And you could blow a fuse at the junction of these and it would create an input to an AND. So there was a, a uh, virtual AND, let's call it, that was created by however many of these were had their fuses flown. Okay, so that means that if you wanted to do a, a toggle circuit such that with every positive edge of the clock, the output would change value, then the rule you're following is that Q bar equals D. In other words, if the D input is going to take the opposite value of what Q is on the next clock, no matter what that value is. And so this is an easy kind of first line. You, you, you connect up, you, you blow the fuse uh, on Q bar to that, and that's all it is. You disable the other, that's a matter of, of blowing pairs of fuses together. But that doesn't matter for what I'm going to do. So anyway, you can create logic, and then you can express that in the fundamental equation here for your output is it uses the colon operator, which means after the clock, or after the next clock. So for the latch, that's the equation. Q colon equals D. Right? And so you can set up another equation for D and plug that in instead of D. And you're just using mathematical substitution. Uh, so that equation becomes colon equals not D. So we're beginning to use a symbolic representation of the physical structure here which is the beginning of software. And it's all bits. Ain't nothing but. So uh, I have built a two-bit, literally, not just pejoratively, uh, logic a state machine with a, an eight by eight matrix. So we have two inputs, we have two uh, latches, and uh, all the combinations that are used tip jacks and uh, pairs of tip plugs with diodes between them. So we're using diode logic. We have a, maybe, schematic is we have a pull up, and we have lines coming down. Each of the inputs has, not inputs, each of the OR terms has a pull up on it. The ORs are implemented by logic in this box. And we're using diodes to create the ands in, you know, the final tradition of uh, early computers, really early computers. So you would have, could have one like this, and so this term would wind up being in and Q, because both of these, I blew it. I got my diodes reversed. They have to point towards the inputs, not the output lines. So unless both of these lines are high, then one of them is pulling the, uh, this line low. And so that's a diode amp. They both have to be high, so it's A and B, or whatever it is, N and Q. So then you have one here, let's say, and your, your logic term out here would be, uh, this, is, this is D, because that's connected to the D input. D equals N and Q, or I'm using the hash, the pound sign for or, this is what they did with uh, the, the PAL, I have not here. I don't know what this does, but you can then plug that in here, and so it's Q equals that. Okay, so this is, this is this, putting this in the other line is like, instead of putting it in, in everything in parentheses, I found parentheses almost impossible to use, because you can't keep track of the equality of 
Um, okay, so what I've built already is a box that kids can use and it can program up to, you know, two bits worth of logic and sequential logic. You can't actually do combinatorial logic, um, but that's okay for stars. Now, you can get the kids, I did a 14-page write-up of um, starting from nothing and getting them up to the point where they can do two-bit counter as a modulo four or a modulo three uh, counter. And then I've been testing this out on the kids at the Hack the Future. Um, and I've realized I'm going to have to do a video because nobody grabs the write-up and says, oh, let me look, don't bother me, and starts bur burrowing into it. They don't do that. Uh, you have to tell them, show them, and it's a show-and-tell universe. But we have the technology. Um, so where this is going uh, is towards what I have always called Kids Pals, using the PAL acronym. Um, and it sounds suitably icky sweet, but uh, <laughs> like it belongs with kids or something. But anyway, um, this is going to be it's something that I've been holding off finishing the design on until I had a better idea of whether I should continue it. And I think I've got that better idea by now. So it's going to be, I'm not going to just drawing a sort of block. Circuit board, approximately that big, I guess. And it'll be divided into four sections, each of which will be identical. Each section is going to have a circuit that is one latch. Uh, actually, we're going to use inverters to drive the matrix here because we need fairly high drive. It's going to include a the equivalent of a uh, 7430 8-bit. I guess that's a low active. No, we'll work this out. Anyway, we want the OR function here. And if you just invert the sense of this logic, it's all negative logic. And you reverse the direction of the uh, uh, diodes. Um, we're going to have two of those in each of these. Uh, there's going to be, let's see, I know there's more than this. Well, whatever. The matrix, instead of being plugs and jacks, is going to be MELF diodes and printed circuit patterns. Now, a MELF diode, as you all know, is, you know, you know a diode, it's cylindrical, okay, and it's got leads. Well, cut off the leads, turn them into metallization around the rings, around the ends, and that's a MELF diode. And they get to manufacture their surface mount devices. Uh, so they are manufacturing huge quantities at low cost. If you set that down on top of a printed circuit pattern, such that one of them is row and one is column, and you've got something insulating that blocks that off so it can't get out, then as long as you have some pressure against it, you should have a good connection. It's going to take a little attention to what kind of uh, surfaces these are, whether tin plating, gold plating, or whatever will be necessary. So I haven't done that research yet. But you will be able, and the kid who has this, will be able to program it by dropping MELF diodes into these cells in this array with the tweezers. So it's tweezer programmable. <laughs> and of course, highly reprogrammable. That's the best part about it not being a fuse programmable device. Now, these days you have, no, there's no more fuse programmable PLDs that I know of. They're all erasable. Nonetheless, it all goes on where you can't see it. It's too small to see anyway. You wouldn't see anything anyway. So you all have to do it in a virtual space by writing uh, equations and, and uh, incantations. What I want to do is to bring the reality of programming it down into the physical domain where there's you know, eight lights in the front. Imagine eight LEDs. 
And there's eight matrices here, and you get to program it that way. Also, you get to choose whether or not you bypass the uh, latch, because that's, that's an alternate output, which gets you the equivalent of the combinatorial version of the chip, the L version, in addition to the registered version. Because there are times when you've got to fan together a lot of logic and so forth, and you don't want registers in the way at every step. Um, they can be dealt with, but it makes the design more complicated, and you don't want kids to have to worry about that. Okay, so you can make a board like this, and it's a kind of an educational toy. What does it do? Well, you know, you're, you start out with the first project is to make the light toggle. Okay, so that's one diode in the right place. And you can cheat, you know, if you can't make this go here, put it here and see it happen. It's make something happen. Um, then you get all of the lights to toggle, then you get them to toggle alternately, and you get to walk a bit along, and you get to do a Johnson counter, fill up and drain, fill up and drain, do a then binary counter, etc. What What can you do with eight bits worth of state machine? You can do a, a certain amount of stuff. Some of it can be moderately impressive to the kids' friends, and that's important. But that's not the point. The point is to allow the kids to gang up. And so a class or a club, if each kid had one of these, and if there were somewhere between, my estimate is about 17 kids, but I'm not sure about that number. And if they can get a hold of the, the, the other board, which is the memory board, they will be able to build a PDP-8S computer. <laughs> that works faster than the original. <clears throat> because the speed of the PDP-8 was, was determined by the memory cycle time, and that was like in the five microsecond area, according to the manual I'm looking at. And you know how fast memory chips are now. <laughs> so even if the diode logic and the capacitance involved here drags it down a little bit from what it would be at the TTL or CMOS speeds, who cares? It's actually going to run faster than the original. And, you know, I don't need to tell you uh, the benefit of having a PDP-8 that has been not only built, but in a very real sense designed by the kids. I mean, yes, they will have been following a cookbook, and it gets to be real interesting as to how you can vary that cookbook. Uh, because it's just crying out for what are the variations you can put. Uh, and that's where some of you guys could come in. Um, so I want to try to create this tool and, and loose it upon the world, and then stand back and rub my own hands and crack tackle. And I was like, now we're going to see some kids who, who know what bits are. I certainly hope and expect. So to my, this is my idea of a worthwhile thing to do, uh, especially in, in my situation where, you know, I, I do have to worry about the time when I won't be able to do anything anymore. Uh, I had a little brush with that, some pancreatitis, and I spent five months in the hospital. I'm fine now, except I've only got a third of my pancreas left. That fortunately was the third I don't need. Um, but that does tend to wonderfully concentrate the mind, as Dr. Johnson said. Um, and this is the sort of thing that ought to exist. Uh, gangs of kids building PDP-8s has some possibilities. Uh, it, it doesn't get them on the internet, but uh, hey, it's a good place to start. And the, I guess the original imp processors weren't all that much more than PDP-8s. They were Honeywell's some sort of things. And, but I, I leave that to all of you to figure out, well, what would the equivalents be? What we, could you make it out of? And I guess leave it to the kids to figure out, uh, in part, with, in conjunction with mentors, how to build it in the most efficient and effective way possible. In a certain sense, I am lashing out against sort of Moore's lawism saying, oh, we don't need to worry about hardware. Hardware just takes care of itself. It just gets cheaper and cheaper and bigger and bigger, and let's just not worry about it. Um, well, I worry about hardware because that's what I make my living designing. And I, you know, it, it sort of bothers me when I get kind of 
waved off and saying, well, you don't matter. You don't, you don't need to make, make hardware better. You just need to make it smaller. I don't believe that. Um, <coughs> sorry. The um, Moore's Law does not include the words, no matter what it costs. That was a little addendum that was sort of effectively added by the semiconductor industry when they used Moore's Law as a standard against which to measure their efforts. And when it costs enough, those standards can go by the wayside, and I think the curves of founder size and so forth and density are uh, proving that out. Okay, well, that's not anything I have had much to do, do about. I don't have any, my hands on the controls there, really no one does. Uh, but we do have our hands on these sort of controls, and this is more important because the, the way that it's implemented is through kids. And they're going to be around for a little while, and they're going to have their effects. So uh, I, you keep your eyes open for this, and it's, if you see it, it's not just my idea, and we'll see what he does with it. I want everybody to think about what you would do with it. So that's really the, the, the end of the, of the talk on, on what I are doing now, aside from looking for a job. <laughs> I also design things to, to order. Um, any questions about anything? Size history or... Yeah. Have you, have you got a physical design to prevent what you drew on the board a few minutes ago? From what? Prevent from what? Dropping the diodes in the wrong way around. You got something clever there? That was the recorder. Ooh, but it's semiconductor, so it won't break. <laughs> uh, I don't have anything that will physically prevent that. You know, that's one of those things. And you tell the kids, try it, see what happens. It's true, yeah, it's not going to break anything. It's not going to break anything. And they'll soon enough find out that this thing is crazy, you know. <laughs> Better put them in right, yes. But you know, I've thought about clock speeds and interconnects. I mean, your clock speeds can be limited by uh, your diodes. The capacitance involved in that uh, uh, diode structure. Whole, uh, whole and the interconnects are also going you know, to They're always a problem. But you know, if you can run at a couple hundred kilometers, it would be okay. I, my first calculation on this, assuming doing the ores in diodes as well, Put me at 11 megahertz. Um, and I, I think that's a good order of magnitude, I put it that way. Somewhere between, but you know, the clock can go down to DC. Uh, and it might be a good thing from a learning standpoint to see what happens. Make a little clock generator that's a crank. And <laughs> can't turn that very fast. So I, I, that's an important thing to be able to do. I would think anything about a couple, couple megahertz is great. Well, at a certain point, like I say, you're outrunning the original computer's speed. And that would be in a couple hundred kilohertz region, as far as I can tell. How many boards are you told about using the whole computer? Well, I started to say 15 to 17, is my guess at the moment. I've got the, the maintenance manual for the PDP 8S off online. And I printed out some of it. And I'm starting to learn the architecture, but I understand there are people here who are more conversant with the PDP-8 architecture than I, <laughs> than even I. <laughs> Which isn't too hard. Okay, ask the man with his hands in the PDP. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm not familiar with the 8S. You know, I have restored the original transistor base S. Transistor base A. Well, right, the, uh, the 8S was the, the serial, which was yeah, it does. So that master scheme serial. wasn't quite as a limitation on that one because it, it, it was a bit serial. So the uh, it had a twelve phase clock, mm -hmm. uh, and it had six states. Um, yeah, but the it, you know the, the memory being five microseconds. So they slowed it down for the AS. The uh, straight eight was uh, one point five microseconds. Well, that was a later one. So no, that was earlier. Really that was really before really. the AS. They they the, 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 manual, the manual says five, but it has, it's got to be a read modified write. Like, yeah, but they, they, they may have used a smaller memory in the ADS because logic for the serial didn't need the faster memory, it's cheaper. 
Um, okay, I mean, it's, it, I, I don't know the answer to that. You, you doubt us no more than I do. Uh, what I'm, what I, I'm hoping to avoid is the necessity for me to sort of painstakingly recreate the architecture, the, 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 the program, in effect, the microcode. What happens for each instruction? That's what I need to know. There what are FPGA talking? limitations of it. If you're, you know, people are re-implemented in FPGAs, uh, if that helps you, and... Is that what Bob Armstrong did? Yeah, although they, they've only implemented the parallel version. So yeah. if you're wanting to know, they put software emulators and PPAs and uh, a hardware FPGA, if you're trying to figure out what is the required to for allow PPA software to run, yeah. uh, and you're not really trying to make a clone of EADS, you're just trying to make something well, that's a bit serial that will run PPA software, I don't know what your goal is. I want to get close to a clone, but it can't be an exact clone. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you got a one, you know, they, I was sure read it said the one bit ALU. So I went to the man and looked at where's the ALU? Well, there isn't an ALU. There is an AND gate and there is a an adder, a one bit adder. And that's it. You do everything by combinations of those. And that's what I don't know is exactly how you do all the instructions using those uh, logical elements. That's the part that I, I, I want to try to achieve. And uh, so I'm going to, I, pardon me. Not really. Even this, uh, the DEX RTL, uh, 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 design architecture they used early on, uh, would that be helpful? I don't know whether, whatever DEX is currently, uh, actually, I'm not sure what that actually is. It's not a DEX. That, I, you know, the, the maintenance so manual is issue. So the maintenance manual issue. No, you yeah. register transfer a while. Yeah, yeah yes. but we wouldn't get, you know, tell you exactly how they get it to implement the ADAS. So they would did do an RTL uh, description for the yeah, ADAS. I don't, S -S yeah, S -S I'm not sure. I don't remember seeing that. I, I, simply for the S, I have around a little bit of documentation, but I have not. Well, the same as Dan, of course, started out with pure logic modules and build out yeah. from there. They've right. got some literature in the 60s. I think mean, you would walk through it and see those. I have not. I, have, I remember looking it over briefly when I was dealing with uh, uh, an LSI 11 and so forth, yeah. and trying to learn how to interface it's, that. It, it's kind of informative, because in a sense, you're in the same boat they were in, in the 60s in trying to, yeah. I mean, to, I, to, to move up from the screen logic gates and something, something more complex. So that was their formal solution at the time. I'm not a very good student because I have this tendency to feel that if I really study what exists, I'll learn the wrong way to do it. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> right, that's what I was talking about, whether you just want to figure out what the, what the operations are required to make it be able to run PDPA software, and then you're just going to figure out using your technology yeah. how you want to implement it, or you really want to try to emulate more or less how they implement the logic. Yeah, I want to stay away from the various tricks and compromises they had to make, which were due to the physical module they were using and decisions, design decisions that have been made in there. There's no need to re-implement those. That's, that's a waste of time. Yeah. Uh, we're working at the equation level here, basically. So I want to take it at that level and try to, to, to understand it there. Um, there is another multi cycle CPU that was around in here, the uh, RCA Cosmac 1802, that had an 8 phase clock. I don't know for a fact it had one bit ALU. I, I think yeah, we have one over here. Yeah, we all have one bit ALU. Well, and then it, it would be an excellent candidate to use these modules to implement. Yeah. Uh, it's a good, interesting question to put it's, forth. I, I'm, thankfully, I don't have to solve it. Uh, that's, you know, you, you thought of it, you do it. Here it is. <laughs> the tool allows you. Um, and that's the benefit of, of making tools. A, you don't have to track all the way through to the end. And B, uh, you don't have to know everything. Anybody have historical questions? Holmberg, Osborne, etc.? They've all been asking me through the day. <laughs> <laughs>
So <laughs> they're all asked that. Okay, well, thanks. And well, question there. Uh, I'll try to keep you posted as to how this goes. I mean, the more I commit myself in front of other people, the more I'm likely to do it. We'll put it on YouTube. So do, you, do you have a price range uh, in mind for each one of these boards? Or? You know, the big price item gets to be the diets. The problem there is how many diets are you going to have to have for each board? Well, obviously you can get more as you require more. Um, but at my first pricing, I don't have the numbers on hand, but I uh, worked out to about an equal if you filled up the whole matrix, which is a, an absurd situation, nothing would work if you did that. Um, the diodes would cost about equal to the amount of the, the, the hardware. The diodes are like five cents each. <coughs> so what is that? It's an A64. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's more than 64 matrix. It's like you've got eight inputs, eight uh, outputs. They're complements. So what is that? 32 by... Eight times eight. Thirty-two by sixty-four. That's getting to be about uh, five plus six, eleven. Two to be eleven plus two, two thousand forty-eight diodes. So two hundred forty-eight locations for diodes. Waving your arms and saying, "Well, you'll never have more than half of those plugged in." So that's a thousand diodes. So a nickel a piece is fifty dollars. Well, hardware. You know, $50 worth of hardware is more than we're going to have here, uh, I think. And that's, that's sort of at the manufacturing cost, not the retail cost level. The diodes aren't retail costs, so you know, it's an unfair comparison. You have to price the board somewhere in the region of $200, and then it's the diodes. So we're talking, the number of gravity numbers out of the air, about $250 for a board and a more or less a full complement of diodes. Like I say, the diodes are fungible. You know, you can buy them as you need them and uh, swap them around. So that's an interesting price mixture question. Yeah. Were, were you thinking of investing David all to make the uh, manual for this? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to think about those sorts of things. <laughs> Trouble is, when you get the old timers together, they waste an awful lot of time telling stories. <laughs> I'd like to hear what you think about, you know, people doing Maker 3D robot and stuff today versus what you guys did in the 70s. Maker 3? Well, like, like, like 3D robots and Maker bots and that kind of thing. Maker bots and things. Well, yeah, I just spent Saturday a couple of hours at the at the near Nancy <coughs> Resistor, which is of which Maker Bot is a spin-off right, effect. Uh, and all of that, to me, is very exciting and very uh, full of possibility. Uh, I would venture to say that I know what it's like uh, to be in an industry that's, that's forming, and that is an industry that's forming. One of the characteristics is nobody can tell you exactly what it is. Uh, but that's never stopped anybody or shouldn't stop anybody. And uh, they are at a you know, the early level as well. And let me tell you my favorite motto. I guess it's on my Facebook page, but I never tire of repeating it. It's a line from a, a comical, a, a, a humorous article that Woody Allen wrote for Playboy magazine when I subscribed to the 60s. And the, issue, the article was on the history of tin ink blots. A tin ink blot, like a novelty item, you take a sheet of tin, you stamp it into a block kind of shape, give it black enamel coating, and now you can throw it down there and say, oh, somebody spilled the ink. The back of the basement had ink wells. Okay, tin ink blots. The first tin ink blots were clumsy, ranging to 11 feet in diameter and full of no one. <laughs> That's roughly the stage where it's at. The present time. And I've been there before with computers. Uh, we were doing that in the, in the first, as they say, those unforgettable next two years, as Ted Nelson put it in 1976. Um, when everybody sort of knew what they wanted to do, but nobody could explain why. Uh, 
And when you're in that situation, you, creativity reigns, and that's a great thing. So I'm, I, I want to try to be involved in that, and, uh, to try to do what I can do, which is, in my case, make tools that uh, facilitates it and, and keeps it loose. Uh, so yeah, I'm very, very pleased with that. I mean, the fact that there's a hacker space here does more in my mind to validate the overall place, which would otherwise be a museum. Now, okay, this is not, well, it's a sort of, you know, you're fixing up all computers, right? Uh, but you really need to be involved in the, the whole process and have, have interchange between the people who are the museum type people and the people who are the hackers. There shouldn't be a, a, a serious distinction. <coughs> in order for a hacker to be well educated, they have to know about the, the old stuff, the way stuff was done. I don't believe in this business about, you know, keep the kids ignorant uh, of history and they'll do better. No, they'll do worse. Uh, that's pretty well been proven. So um, I think that it's a, uh, I think it's really important. In, in part because the whole question of uh, what <laughs> what is making things all about, how do you do it, who gets involved, um, who shouldn't be involved, I mean, is that an all set? I don't know. Uh, and, uh, and, and how that involvement uh, gets expressed is one of the major questions of our time. In a way, we're talking about sort of the, I'm not going to say the transition out of the industrial age, the transition to the next level of the industrial age. Um, this is, question is a little bit off topic, I'm going to call it. Um, so you were involved in the free speech movement at Berkeley. What do you think of things like Occupy Wall Street? In kind of a similar way, they're sort of doing exploration in that political space, in socioeconomic space. Uh, I'm very hardened by it because it reminds me of, of what was going on back then. You know, we... You know, the reason why I even got into what became personal computers was because I got into what became social media, what was becoming social media. And I, the reason I got into that was that I was looking for how I, as an engineer, could provide tools that people could use to uh, develop and sustain communities the way they needed to be, which is generally not the way we have them. And that came from my experience in the free speech movement in which I lived in and participated in an actual revolution. It's a revolution because, I mean, many people may not know the details, but I won't go into the detail. I started the Free Speech Movement archives for that process, fsm-a.org. Build the old documents there. But the it was a in 1964 at Berkeley, it was a mass movement that overturned an existing order. It was the order of in loco parentis, in which the university was seen as legally being in the position of parent. And then it also had a third characteristic which qualifies it as being a revolution, which is it had unforeseen effects uh, that kept going. One of which was that it put me on a path because I, I was sufficiently excited by it. I wanted life to be like that. And to do that, you had to have different tools. I knew that much. And so that it set me off exploring. And after a while, by 1970, I concluded that we needed to have networked computers. And then the next thought I had was, like, where are you going to get a computer? No one. Well, it happened sooner than I thought. And uh, the when I see, uh, you know, there's obviously the temptation for the old timers to say, well, the kids these days say they're not as good as we were. Uh, they, they keep getting proven wrong and say that. We do, I guess. I'm prone to that at times in my pessimistic moments. But I'm, I'm very optimistic in the Occupy Wall Street of what it's going to become. So 
the mechanism is not going to be all about occupying, it's going to be about other things. It's, it's activism generated from and energized by itself needs, not theory. And uh, I'm very interested in it, and we're at, I had a meeting with a few of our board members for the First Speech Movement Archives yesterday, and we talked about how we could uh, integrate what we're doing, the kind of resources we have, uh, to be helpful in that regard. So we're not just sitting in a musty ar archive somewhere saying, if they only knew how great we were. Uh, it doesn't work that way. More questions? Yes. Um, in your homebrew computer club, how did you recruit members? How did you advertise? How did you handle that? Well, at the outset, uh, it started because a guy named Fred Moore had parked himself outside the community computer center, which is in Menlo Park, California. It was a place where uh, it all comes from a guy named Bob Al Albrecht, who got fired from Control Data Corporation because he was in sales and he arranged for classes of kids to come into their display at computer shows and show how easy it was to program their computers. Control Data, the mainframe manufacturer, did not like that in the slightest and they got rid of it. But he then set off on a crusade that he's still on to show, to get kids together with computers. He wrote books on it, basic games, and one of the spin-offs of this was that some people set up some terminals, original teletypes, on timeshare basic, and eventually got a PDP-8 in-house, and it was a little, I call it the people's pachinko parlor. Uh, it's like kids would come in and they'd play computer games. And playing computer games on a teletype is a lot different than playing computer games today. <laughs> it maintained the interest of some of them. Um, Fred Moore, and this is a place he he didn't have a lot of formal structure, so he could hang around there. He started collecting names and addresses and the contact information of people that came in because he said he was interested in starting a class on, on hardware. And uh, Fred had a, 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 his history was a, of activism. In his case, he was a, a uh, radical pacifist and. Uh, he probably should have been an engineer because one of the things he did on one of his many sort of one-man demonstration walk the length of and breadth of, of the, the Americas, he would build these little cook stoves from tin cans and things like that. He, he prototyped them and tried them out. He, he died in 1997 in an automobile accident and at his memorial service that had some examples of these, which were good work, as far as I could tell. Okay, so, so he was going to organize something. And he wasn't sure what. And then the Altair was announced. Now, in the meantime, the guy down that, and it was a store in the same row, was Gordon French. And he was selling slot car uh, parts, uh, motors, and so forth. Gordon was a computer programmer, and so all he had to do to support that habit. And uh, had actually built himself a personal computer with an 8008. I never got to see. So I suppose I had to take his word for it. But anyway, the two of them got to talking, and Gordon offered his garage uh, because the Altair, the first uh, copy of the Altair, was being sent around for review by publications and people's computer companies, which was Bob Albrecht's publication that I was hanging around was on the list. So that computer guy came to town, got passed around through a couple of hands, and then uh, made its more or less public de debut at the garage of Gordon French on March 8th, 1975. Uh, and uh, Moore, Fred Moore uh, Xeroxed up for $5 or something, some half-page announcements of Amateur Computer Club group forming come here at this time. He sent it out to the people on his list. I was actually not on the list. I found out about it from actually Bob Marsh, who was a friend of mine. And uh, we both went. And uh, 30 guys in the garage. That was the first meeting at Homebrew Computer Club. Now, I'm not sure I remember what the question was exactly. I'll just recount it. 
Advertisement. Advertisement. So there was some advertisement directly now happened a little bit, and a lot of word of mouth. And after that, word of mouth pretty much covered it. We did have a newsletter, but the daily uh, subscription list, you had to make it some kind of donation. It was highly encouraged. It wasn't one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, and you got me out the, the newsletter. The news, the mailing list was 3,000 names by 1978. We had it on a teletype roll and sort of put them the meeting. The room only held 276 people. Uh, so there was a pretty huge flow through the meeting, and therefore they were talking about it. Anyway. I was, I happened to be at a book party for Esther Dyson, and it was held at the, the offices of Kleiner Perkins, Crawfield Buyers, who were there. At that time, were the number one venture capital company in Silicon Valley. And a little guy with glasses comes up to me and says, I don't, I, you probably don't remember me. I used to attend a homebrew computer club meetings in 1980. I was an engineer for Intel at the time, and they were very interesting. A lot of people tell me this. But he was John Doerr, who was the number one top dog of venture capitalist at that time. And if it included him, it included a whole lot of other people. And I'm sure he wasn't on Fred Moore's list. Uh, so I didn't ask him, he probably heard about it at Intel. So it was mostly a word of mouth proposition. Uh, in that case, you, you know, it, it helps to have as tight a, a, as highly interconnected a place as Silicon Valley work. On the other hand, connectivity these days is a different matter than the physical word of mouth, the internet. It's just a matter of networks. And the internet is how we got started. We, our group formed about Leo work, and all we wanted to do was get together people's garages and work on computers and have your pizza. Um, <laughs> we ended up having much more than we dreamed of, but it's the same thing. It was the internet version of what I'm out. Yeah. yeah. Well, in 1986, when I closed the, meeting, the, the Homo Club down, I did that after a year's <coughs> grace period because, in my view, they had become the old fart society. <laughs> it's the same faces all the time, not very many of them, and they all just wanted to comment on whatever was happening. And that never was the purpose of the Humber Club. And I, I knew that it, we should try to go online, but I didn't have the means to do that in 1985, 86, not that, you know, we, not that I could make it happen, nobody came forth to do it. So I decided, okay, it's over. Um, these days, we have documents. And could always do better. Of course, that's the part what, of what is your take? I mean, obviously, in Silicon Valley, you have this beautiful computer museum, millions of dollars, and full time staff, and people like us, just a bunch of hobbyists, screwing around. Uh, what do you see as like 